Good morning. Today, Pastor Peter Chen will share the message from the book of Galatians, chapter 2, verses 15 through 21. In honor of Filipino American Heritage Month, I will read in Tagalog and in English. Hear the word of the Lord. Tayo mismo ay ipinanganak ng mga Judeo at hindi mga makasalanang hentil. Nalalaman natin na walang sino mang itinuturing na matuwid sa pamamagitan ng pagsunod sa kautusan, kundi sa pamamagitan ng pananampalataya kay Heso Kristo. Kaya tayo'y sumasampalataya kay Kristo Jesus upang ituring na matuwid sa pamamagitan ng pananampalataya kay Kristo at hindi sa pamamagitan ng pagsunod sa kautusan. Sapagkat walang sino mang itinuturing na matuwid dahil sa pagsunod sa kautusan. Ngunit kung tayo mismo na nagsikap na maituring na matuwid dahil sa ating pakikipag-isa kay Kristo ay natagpo ang makasalanan, nangangahulugang bang si Kristo ay tagapagtaguyod ng kasalanan? Hindi ganyan. We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we, too, have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law no one will be justified. But if, in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. Kung ang mga winasak ko'y muli kong itatayo, pinatutunayan ko sa aking sarili na ako ngay makasalanan. Namatay na ako sa kautusan sa pamamagitan na rin ng kautusan upang ako'y mabuhay para sa Diyos. Namatay na akong kasama si Kristo sa krus. Hindi na ako ang nabubuhay ngayon kundi si Kristo na ang nabubuhay sa akin. At ang buhay ko ngayon sa pamamagitan na ng pananampalataya sa anak ng Diyos na nagmahal na sa akin at naghandog ng kanyang buhay para sa akin. Hindi ko pinapawalang halaga ang kagandahang loob ng Diyos. Kung ang tao'y ituturing na matuwid sa pamamagitan ng kautusan, namatay si Kristo na walang kabuluhan. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if the righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, Good morning, everyone. So glad you could join us for this time of worship and fellowship. I wanted to begin just with a quick kind of encouragement for us. Uh, We have just passed the seventh month of uh, quarantine and not meeting in person. We are entering into the eighth month. Uh, We don't know exactly when we will be meeting in person. There is no definite timeline that we've been given that uh, that we can tell. And... um, I think throughout this process, in the past couple of weeks especially, it's felt very heavy for me, just knowing that we've come so far, not knowing how much further we have to go, and not knowing where the hope lies in all of this. And it can feel a sense of fatigue that's that's kind of um, falling, and a sense of discouragement that I think many of us are feeling and experiencing. Uh, But in the past couple of weeks, I've been reading through the book of Exodus, and reminded that the Israelites probably felt so similar to us all throughout their journey. Discouraged. They didn't know how long they would be somewhere. They didn't know where they were going. They didn't know the way forward. And over and over again, when you continue to read through Exodus, God makes a way. He makes a way to be freed from slavery. He makes a way through the Red Sea. He makes a way for them to be provided for and sustained all throughout all of their journey in the wilderness. And so it's a story of not knowing what's happening, not knowing how long it's going to be, and yet God always is faithful and makes a way. And I think my encouragement that I took away for myself that uh, I hope that we're encouraged by is that, yes, it's been a long journey, and we don't know how much further we have to go. And the news that we get and the direction and the leadership 
takes us in all different directions. But don't forget God, right? That as we process the events that we're going through, don't forget about who God is and that our God specializes in making a way and sustaining us when there is no other way. And so just in our, in our reading, in our, in our thinking, in our understanding of this time, not to omit the presence and the power of God from the situation, from the context that we are facing. Um, that we will make it through this. One day, again, I don't know what that day is going to be. We're going to look back on this time. And we're going to have I Survived 2020 t-shirts. And we're going to tell our kids a story of why they get COVID vaccines. And they didn't have to do that before. We're going to look back on this moment. And we're going to do that because our God will make a way. And so I just want to encourage you with that. that. That gave me a breath of life. And I hope that it does for you as well. Uh, that is not the sermon, though. I have another sermon lined up that I'm starting now, uh, which is talking about grace. We've been talking about the importance of grace, how fundamental it is, but also it's so difficult. You have this incredibly fundamental idea, which is also so difficult to understand and to live out. And we're going to go through another one of those difficulties today. But before we do that, let's review some of the most essential features of grace. Grace is a gift, right? That's what that word means uh, in the Greek. It means gift. Grace is not what we earn. It's not a wage. It's not a payment for something. It is something that we are given, that we did not earn, that we do not deserve. And there are so many different forms of grace, so many different uh, gifts that God gives us that we do not earn. But the one grace that perfectly reflects the breadth and the depth of the gifts that God gives is Jesus, that Jesus is God's own son given to us to show us and to teach us and to give his life for us, the very best of gifts given to us while we were still sinners, as we read in Romans chapter 5, given to us when we were at our very worst. And so Jesus reflects grace to its very best and its very worst, the very best gift given to us at our very worst moment. And so Christ reflects and captures grace perfectly. And what we also have said over and over is that grace really is the foundation of Christian faith. We can often get into this very common perception that we are Christians because we do good things. We are Christians because we read the Bible and we do all the good things, and that is what makes us Christians. But grace reminds us that's not really what has brought us into faith, what, what makes us Christians is not what we have done or what we do. Instead, what makes us Christians is what God has done. It's not about our goodness. It's about God's goodness. That Christianity fundamentally is not about people getting what they deserve. It's the exact opposite. Christianity is about people getting what they don't deserve. And what they have not earned. And it's such an important reminder that we don't slide into this common, popular understanding of faith that we are Christians because of what we have done. We are Christians because what God has done for us. And so that's what we've talked about and some of the things that we have returned back to over and over. We've talked about grace. But as we explore these ideas, there is one central question or quandary or debate that emerges out of it and has from the very beginning of the early church, and that is this age-old ethical question. So why should we do good works and avoid bad works if we are saved only by grace? If we are saved only by virtue of what God has done and not by what we have done at all, then why does it matter what we do? Why should we do good things? Why should we avoid the bad things? Because after all, it's all about grace. It's all about what God has done. What is the purpose and the role of works and our moral behavior in the, the construct of grace, in this paradigm of grace? Does it have any bearing at all? This has been a question that has emerged in the church but continues to be something that we think about and that we process even to this day. Oftentimes there are two tendencies that we fall into, two ways in which we try to reconcile the purpose of good works and grace at the same time. And these two extreme kind of tendencies that we can fall into, I would call our legalism and license. The legalistic tendency or else the license tendency. The legalism tendency I would define like this. This is where we accept grace 
But we still insist that moral behavior is essential to righteousness. And this is where we say, yes, grace, absolutely, I am a Christian because of grace. But in our minds, in our hearts, in what we say, we often say that, that works are right up there along with it. That along with grace, there are things we have to do and have to behave in a certain way in order to be Christians. If you don't do these things, then you really can't be a Christian at the same time. And this goes all the way back to the first century, really to the Judaizers. The Judaizers were a perfect example of this kind of mentality, that they were Jewish Christians who believed that Jesus had died for, to pay for their sins, but at the same time, they also had to fulfill Jewish customs, Jewish rituals. And those two things were necessary, grace, but also good works. And so that's how sometimes we try to make sense of good works and grace, that they are equal in importance. Yes, grace, but we also need to be doing the right things in order to be Christians. The other tendency that we can often fall into is a tendency of license. And that is where we accept grace to the point where we feel moral behavior has little importance, little weight on our lives. This is where we take grace and we kind of run away with it, where we say it's not by our works that we are saved, and so our works really don't mean that much. It doesn't matter if I do this or do that, because that's not what makes me right with God. It's grace, ultimately. And so we begin to de-emphasize our works and our moral behavior. That's just legalism. That's just Phariseeism. It's really all about grace ultimately. And so that's the opposite approach that we often take to the point where we don't think our works mean anything at all. And that also has a a foothold in the early church and very early on in in the life of the body, in the Greco-Roman culture. There were many believers who came out of the the Hellenist or the Roman cultures, and these cultures were very prone to excess in many different ways. They had entire philosophies that were focused on human pleasure, that the ultimate good was human pleasure. Hedonism. Hedonism is not a modern word. It is an ancient Greek philosophy. Epicureanism came out of that as well, focused on pleasure. They had... um, Uh, the the works of temple prostitution, right? That a way to worship the gods, to worship Aphrodite, was actually to sleep with prostitutes. They had Bacchanal feasts or Dionysian feasts, depending on if you were Greek or Roman, where they would just get incredibly drunk, and the accounts of these feasts were very extreme. And so this was a common practice. This was part of the culture, the regular culture of Greek and Roman times. And so for Greek and Roman Christians, they loved grace because grace permitted this. Grace said, it doesn't really matter if you go to the the temple of, uh, uh, of Aphrodite. It doesn't really matter if you go to Bacchanal feast. It doesn't matter if you do all these things because we are not saved by what we do or do not do. We're saved only by grace. So they loved grace because it, it justified everything that they did. Then why did it matter? Because we're saved only by what God has done. It doesn't matter what we do. And so this is an age-old debate that, continue, that, that from the very earliest moments really began to confuse the church. How do we live out grace? And it does so even to this time. And maybe a case in point to make this more well, a concrete is to think about swearing. Swearing. And maybe just because I'm a dad, I think about swearing and whether my kids are, are hearing the stuff or saying these kinds of things, uh, which they never do, kids. I know you're watching me right now. But swearing, I think, is a very simple and very universal kind of uh, context to think about grace. Is it okay to swear or is it not okay to swear? The legalist perspective would say, no, you do not swear. If you swear... You're not a Christian. And oftentimes, if you think about it, we we kind of approach things that way. Where we think about someone swearing and we think, are you a Christian? The Christians shouldn't do that, right? We make one of the essential parts of Christianity whether you use this word or that word. And so that could be the legalistic understanding of Christianity. The Christians do not use those kinds of words. But there is also the license approach where there are people who say, why does it matter if you swear? That's just, uh, we're saved by what what God has done. And if we say a swear word, that's not going to do anything. And so they swear freely. In fact, I know Christians by name 
who use very salty language almost as a way of claiming grace, as a way of saying, hey, I'm saved by grace, and so I can use this word, and I'm still okay with God because it's not about what I've done. It's really about what God has done for me. Very similar to what Greek and Roman believers believed all the way back in the first century. And so they'll use uh, very colorful language because of grace, as a way of illustrating grace. And so even, and this is just like one example. The honest truth is that there are no ends of examples in which we struggle to figure out, is this right or is this wrong? What, what does grace mean with this moral behavior? And we often feel divided because of this as well. So how do we figure this out? How do we make sense of the relationship between our moral behavior, our good works, avoiding bad works, and the concept of grace? Well, Paul had to confront this, obviously, in the early church. And so he has three simple ways that he addresses this, especially in the book of Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 6, he addresses this um, directly with the Corinthian church because, again, coming out of Greek culture, they were very comfortable with temple prostitutions. They would go to the temple and and be with prostitutes as a way of glorifying uh, um, Aphrodite. This was very natural for them to do. And again, they saw grace as a confirmation of this. Why couldn't I do this? Grace, you know, why does it matter what I do with my body? And this is Paul's response in 1 Corinthians 6. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach and stomach for food. God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual morality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And so Paul talks to these believers who have used kind of license and are running away with things, and what he basically tells them is this. That we are permitted to do much because of grace, but not all that we are permitted to do is good for us. He creates a distinction between permission and benefit. That yes, you may be permitted to do something, technically, theologically speaking, doesn't mean it's good for you. Just because you're allowed to do something doesn't mean that it's, it's the way your body was made. It doesn't mean that it will feed your soul. And so that is one of the ways that he encourages the Corinthian church to think about grace, but also good works. To remember whether something is beneficial for us or the way that we are created to be. So that's one way that he does it. Another way that he kind of reconciles good works and graces in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And there he addresses another tendency, another debate or, or um, controversy in the early church, and that was eating food sacrificed to idols. Because there were a lot of different religions and beliefs at that time, they would often sacrifice food to Zeus or to Jupiter, depending on your, uh, uh, your perspective, and then people would eat of that sacrifice. And Christians didn't know what to do with that. Should we eat that? It was sacrificed to Zeus. And other people would say, no, this is fine. Why does it matter? And so Paul had to help them understand that. And so he does that in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And he begins by giving the philosophical, ethical kind of answer. And what he says is this in 1 Corinthians 8 chapter 8. He says, Zeus doesn't exist. He says, "Uh, Zeus doesn't exist. And so if you're sacrificing to Zeus you're not sacrificing to anything, right? Because there's only one God, and that is God. So don't be afraid that this is being sacrificed to something. It's being sacrificed to nothing. Food's not going to help you get closer to God. Neither is it going to take you further away. It's just food. And so that's what he says. So he basically says, he begins by saying, you can eat that food because it's being sacrificed to an imaginary God. It's not going to hurt you. But he doesn't end there. He doesn't just say, yeah, go ahead. Everyone should do it. He goes on to say this in verse 9. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause them to fall. And so here, Paul is helping the the Corinthian church to understand that grace and good works still have a relationship by telling them this, that we are permitted to do much because of grace, 
But not all that we are permitted to do is good for those around us. That yes, there is more permission because of grace. We do not have to fulfill the law to the same degree. But just because you're allowed to do it doesn't mean that it'll help other people. And that's another thing that we need to consider as we live out grace is, yes, I might be allowed to do this, but it's actually helping the people around me. If it's not, I have the freedom to say no, the freedom not to do those things. The third way in which he addresses this comes out of Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 contains maybe the most concise and full description of grace that we find in Scripture where it says this in verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Now, if we stop right there, this is a, a great description of grace by itself, saying grace is from God. It's God's work. You can't boast. It's not of your works. Period. End of story. That's it. But that's not a period for, for Paul. He doesn't end there and say, good works have no purpose because of grace. Instead, he goes on to say this. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In the very same breath, he says, you are not saved by your works, you cannot boast, but good works still have a purpose. You are made to do them. And in fact, in the Greek, there is no period. There is, these aren't two separate phrases. It's one gigantic run-on sentence where it's one idea, one single idea, which is you are not saved by your good works. You are saved to do good works. And that is what he teaches the church in Ephesus. We are saved by grace and not by our good works. Instead, we are saved in order to do good works. Good work still has a place, even in light of grace, in a different order. The order is flipped. It's not that we do good works so that we might receive grace. It's that we have received grace in order to do those good works. It's what we find in the life of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus does these amazing good works, but what is the order in Luke chapter 19? Does he do these good works and give half his possessions to the poor and, and, and uh, pay reparations so that God might see him, so that Jesus might spend time with him? No. Jesus already sees him. Jesus already wants to spend time with him. And out of the overflow of the grace that he has received, good works emerge. That's good works for us. No, we don't do good works so that God will love us. God loves us, so we do good works. So here are just three simple ways in which Paul helps to reconcile grace and our moral behavior. And if you're hearing this for the first time, I think these are incredibly helpful. Even if you've heard it a hundred times, these are good reminders. For some of us, though, we have heard this a hundred times. You've read these passages. You've heard sermons and maybe read books about them, and yet we still struggle. And yet we still have a difficult time understanding how to live out grace and still be moral people at the same time. There is one more thing that Paul does in order to explain grace and good works. And it's this. Besides legalism and license, there are the third approach we can take in understanding grace, and that is a Christ-centered approach. In the book of Galatians, Paul is making a case for grace because the church in Galatea has forgotten about grace. They knew grace, but because the Judaizers exerting their influence, they have fallen back and they're becoming more uh, um, Jew uh, uh, kind of legalistic in this way where they are insisting that people do certain things. So the book of Galatians is Paul trying to help them remember grace. He is, it's a thesis on grace. And Ephesians chapter 2 is a central part of that. He's explaining grace. As we reread Galatians chapter 2, take note of how he explains this, how he tries to convince them an understanding of grace. And look at the word choice. Don't look at the actual details of every phrase, but look at the words he chooses to use. We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in in Christ Jesus, 
that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ is promoting sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. And so in this explanation of grace, he's this, this debate about grace, this controversy about grace that is infecting the church in Galatea, he only uses the word grace one time in this passage. Instead, when he talks about it, he doesn't talk about an idea. He talks about a person, and that person is Jesus. And so what we have to understand about Paul And how he understands grace and how he explains it is this. For Paul, grace is not a philosophical concept or moral debate. Grace is a person. It is the person of Jesus. That is how he approaches grace. For him, it's not this, 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 should I do this, should I not do this? This moral uh, uh, controversy or this question that gets thrown around. Instead... Grace is a person, not a concept, not an idea, not a debate. It is Jesus. It reminds me of what our sister Helen Mitchell wrote last week in the live chat. If you don't know Helen, Helen is our congregational worship leader. She worships, she leads worship from the pews. And last week she wrote this. Yes, grace is a person. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. This is the way that Paul understands grace is that he connects it, he ties it to the person of Jesus. And that has powerful effects in how we approach the understanding of grace in all of these questions. The first thing that it does is that connecting grace to Jesus connects grace to the cross. Oftentimes when we think about grace and we make it into a kind of a an ethical debate, it's just this thing. uh, We have this gift of forgiveness, and so should we be doing this? Should we not be doing this? And so we kind of isolate the debate into itself, and we forget why we have grace. We have grace because Jesus died on the cross for us. And when we connect the grace that we have received to the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, as Paul did in Galatians chapter 2, verse 21, it lends a sense of weightiness and soberness, and sacrifice to these questions. No longer are they just these ideological questions where you say, yes, you are allowed to do this. No, you're not allowed to do this. But instead, there is a sacrifice attached to it. And we take it so much more seriously and personally because we know the cost at which grace was given to us. Think about swearing. Think about how we justify swearing. Yes, you shouldn't do it. You shouldn't do it. Uh, no, I can do whatever I want. Think about it now in light of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. That if I have a legalistic perspective, no, you, you can't do that. If you swear, you're becoming not a Christian. You're taking away Christianity. You're breaking it down. If we look at it in light of the cross, we could say this. So Jesus, the Son of God, took the weight of human sin upon his shoulders, and he nailed it there. He nailed all of human sin and bore it upon the cross himself. And you're telling me that if a person swears, they can break that down. They can hack at the root of Jesus' work because they use bad language. Is that what we're saying? And then that same question has a different answer. It feels like, no, it doesn't feel right anymore when we look at it in light of the cross. Even the opposite perspective about legal uh, license. I can swear whenever I want. It's all about grace. You know, grace allows me to do all these things. Again, look at that same exact moral question, but now at the foot of the cross. And then we say instead, Jesus gave his life. He hung on the cross for us, for our sins. And he did that so you can say swear words. That's what he did. He died on the cross to give you the permission 
to say nasty things to people when they're driving badly? Is that really what he did? Same question, should I swear? But now it's very different. The sense of like, uh, I don't feel comfortable anymore becomes different because we remember that grace was purchased for us. It's not simply something that we have. It is something we are given because of a sacrifice. It changes that question. Another thing that seeing, connecting grace to Jesus does, it connects grace to the nuance and compassionate nature of Jesus' ministry. When we look at grace as a moral or ethical debate, it's simply something where we say, is this right to do? Is it wrong to do? Is this person a sinner? Is he not a sinner? And so we kind of have this black and white moral, ethical approach to it, very much like the Pharisees did. Remember the Pharisees in the Gospels? That's exactly what they say. Jesus has this person sinned. Is it right or wrong for someone to get divorced? It's the same perspective, and we often have that same kind of cut and dry, black or white kind of understanding of these kinds of questions. But that's not how Jesus processed these questions. When we look in the scriptures, he doesn't say, he's not like the Terminator walking around, you know, bad, good, good person, bad person. Instead, he has this much more, he has a different lens. He's looking at people through a human lens, looking at their situation, taking into account who they are and where they are. He's not looking at it as a moral debate. Instead, he's looking at people as human beings. He does that all the time. He sees a Pharisee. He doesn't say, Pharisee, can't do anything with you. He sees Nicodemus. He sees a tax collector who is collaborating with the Romans, who has stolen from the Jewish people. And he sees Zacchaeus. He sees a woman caught in adultery, and he, tells, he doesn't say, well, I can't spend any time with you. He protects her from the crowd that wants to stone her in the book of John, and that says, go and sin no more. He sees a Samaritan woman, an enemy of the Jewish people who has had many, many romantic partners, and he sees someone who he has called to be her Messiah. You see, he doesn't look at these questions as ethical debates. He looks at them as human beings. Not simply as, can I do this? Should I not do this? But he takes this different, a totally different contextual approach of looking at them as human situations. And I think we need to do the same. Take swearing, for example. Again, I don't know why swearing is fixated in my mind. We think about swearing and we think, wherever you swear, it's the same kind of thing. If you say the, this word in one place, you say it in the next place, it's all the same to us. It's all bad right? Can that really be the case? I mean, you might have someone on the road, you know, someone stopped at the stoplight too long, and they drop a terrible word out there, and they're, they're, you know, whatever word, the G word. I don't know if there's a G word, H word, I word, whatever it might be. They drop that word. It's bad, shocking, horrifying, right? But what if someone uses that same word because their life is falling apart? What if they use that word because the community around them is broken? What if they use that word because they have lost someone unjustly and unfairly and they have lost a loved one and they use that same word? Can we judge those two same situations the same? Should we say in a moral, ethical framework, bad, bad? Should that be our approach? No. I think our approach should be that of Jesus, looking at the reasons why, the context, a human approach. Asking the question, man, that word is salty and it hurts me to hear it, but why are they saying it? Are they saying it because their neighborhood is broken and no one will listen? No one's paying attention. And so they drop that bomb in order to wake people up around them. Surely that is different from another situation where someone's just being loose with their language and they don't care who they're hurting. We need to take away the moral, ethical approach to grace and bring in the human one that Jesus did. Lastly, connecting grace to Jesus connects grace to love. Grace is a huge concept into itself. It is, like we have said, the foundation of our faith. And so it's easy to kind of wrap our, our, our arms around it and kind of be so focused on the idea and the concept of grace. But one thing that we need to keep in mind as we think about grace is this. Grace is only a tool. Grace is only an action. It is what God gives us. It is not the explanation as to why he gives it to us. 
It's not the motivation. It's what we're given, but it does not explain why God gave it to us. The motivation for grace, the grace that we are given, is told us in Romans chapter 5. God proves that he loves us through grace by giving his son while we were still sinners. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave us the gift of Jesus Christ that whoever would follow and believe in this son would have eternal life. We have to remember that grace is only the consequence. It's only the effect, but the cause and the motivation is always love. In Jesus' life, grace and love are one thing. You don't get grace without the love, right? It's the love that motivates God to give us grace. And so it connects the concept of grace to love. These are not separate things. And oftentimes when we treat this as an ideological debate, we can actually divorce love from it altogether. We can throw around these debates. Should I be doing this? Should I not be doing this? And never use the word love one time. But when we connect grace to Jesus, we remember we can't do that. Grace and love are two, are two sides of one reality. God loves us, so he gives us grace. God adores us, and so he gives us good gifts. And that's a reminder to us that whenever we ask questions about grace, we are asking questions about love at the same exact time. It's not just a question about whether I should do this. It's a question of, am I loving myself when I do this? It's not just a question of, am I permitted to do this thing? It's a question of, when I do this, am I loving those around me? It's not just a question of of, of shall I do or shall I not do. It's a question of how do I love God the best through this? How does God receive more of my love through what I do? And so the debate about grace is always one and the same with debate about love. That is the power of connecting grace to Jesus. It It reminds us of the sacrifice that purchased grace for us. It reminds us that grace cannot be taken uh, separately from love. And it reminds us not to have an ideological approach to this, but a human and compassionate one instead. And that's why Paul does something very interesting all throughout his epistles. He very often does not use grace as a word unto itself. Instead, he'll always say, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Over and over. 2 Corinthians 13 the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 16, the grace of our Lord Jesus. Galatians 6, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 4, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I just want to leave you with that, that as we journey in grace, as we think about grace, as we try to live out grace, live out all of it, the entire phrase, Not grace, the idea. Not grace, the concept. Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And let the life and the sacrifice and the love of Jesus guide us in how we live out grace. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, help us to see grace in light of you. Not just as a concept we have to understand, but a Savior that we know. Help us to remember that you bought grace for us through your blood and that we should take it so seriously as a result. Help us to remember that you didn't look at grace as a, um, a quiz or a test, but instead as human beings. Help us to ask these questions from that human, compassionate point of view. And help us to always ask the question of love as we ask the question of grace. Am I loving myself? Am I loving the people around me? Am I loving the God who gave me grace? Help us to do that, to know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.